in five, four, three. Good evening, everybody. My name is Aidan Buckley. I'm the Manager of Communications and Engagement at the Sunshine Coast Regional District. And you're very welcome to our uh, Let's Talk Water session. And tonight, our focus is on the, the Water Meter Program. I want to start tonight by acknowledging that the Sunshine Coast Regional District is within the traditional territories of the Seashot Nation and the Squamish Nation. So our Let's Talk Water sessions are designed to keep you informed on current projects and initiatives. And as I mentioned earlier, Tonight, our focus is on the water meter program. So just some housekeeping, if you want to ask a question at all and throughout the session, you can type in the Q&A uh, down the bottom of your screen. You can also raise your hand um, and you can come on screen and you can ask your question directly to the panel. And tonight's session is gonna be about an hour and 15 minutes long. Uh, we're gonna have a short presentation at the start followed by questions. So. Uh, also a reminder that tonight's session is being recorded. It's uh, streaming live on uh, YouTube. So hello to folks who are watching us uh, tonight on YouTube. Thanks for uh, spending your evening with us. And uh, yeah, and then the recording will be available after tonight's session for anybody who would like to, uh, to watch it. So I'm just gonna start by doing a quick run around the screen here and, uh, and introduce, introducing the folks um, who you can see right now. And starting off with uh, Remco Rosenboom, who's our General Manager of Infrastructure Services. Sunshine Coast Regional District. And um, Jen Callahan, who's our Water Sustainability Coordinator. We've also got Dean McKinley, who is our Chief Administrative Officer. Um, we've got these, uh, District of Seashot Directors, um, Mary Dan Alva Seegers, and also uh, Director Alton Toth. And also then we've got the Chair of the Sunshine Coast Regional District and Area B Director, Laurie Pratt. Um, I think Laurie, you're gonna say a few words before we, we dive into the, the presentation here. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Aidan. And, um, and thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, we know that uh, water is a key issue for, um, for all, most residents on the Sunshine Coast. And we're really thrilled to have this as our Let's Talk, our second Let's Talk Water session of the year. Uh, we are, I think this is a really great time if you're able to ask any questions because I know there's a, there are quite a few questions about why we're going through the alternative approval process, why we're focusing on water meters and um, rather than concentrating on just adding to our water supply. So it, I think it's really important uh, to understand why we're looking at water meters for the purpose of conservation, for finding leaks and it's so important to have conservation of that treated water within our system. And um, I know we're all really looking forward to answering the questions that you have. So go ahead and start typing them in now. Um, we look forward to, uh, to uh, answering them as we go through this conversation. And I'll pass it back over to you, Aiden. And once again, thank you all. Thank you, Chair Pratt. So um, we're gonna have a short presentation now and uh, followed by a Q and A session. So if at any time during this presentation you'd like to ask a question, like I said, just put it into the tab at the bottom there um, or raise your hand and um, we'll get to them as soon as the presentation is finished up. So uh, I'm going to throw it over to Jen now um, to, to kick off the presentation. And I know we got a couple of poll questions as well. So um, yeah. Thank you. I'd love to start with a quick poll of um, people that have logged in via Zoom today. Um, Bryce, our IT person, thank you. Um, if you don't mind taking a quick moment to share if a water meter is servicing your home right now and what area of the Sunshine Coast you're, you currently live in. Jen, we're seeing the text with all the notes, etc. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Just 
Well, you're doing that, Jan. It looks like we've got about a 50-50 split, just so folks are aware in the poll. Um, that uh, we got 53% of participants who uh, don't have a water meter. We got 47% who do. And we have uh, most of our folks tonight are joining us from the District C Shelt and some folks from Area A, D, uh, E, and F as well. So uh, appreciate all your input and throughout this uh, this session here. So, um, Jam Road, you're newer. You're good to go. All right, we'll try to share again. Thanks, everyone. Am I better? No, still not. Still not. Goodness. Okay. Do you want me to share? Please. Thank you. Um. Now I have to start, of course. Why not? Just while we're waiting to share, just to let uh, everybody know, we do have quite a lot of information about the uh, the water meter program um, up on our new engagement website on uh, Let's Talk SCRD. So if you uh, go on to uh, SCRD forward slash Let's Talk, you can go on, you can check out um, two separate project pages, and um, one which deals solely with the alternative approval process and the AAP, which we'll be learning more about uh, throughout this presentation. And then a whole other project which solely speaks to uh, the water metering program. Um, and you're going to find over the next couple of weeks, you know, through local media and across social media as well. And we're going to be sharing some information and that could be interesting to folks just to, to, to get better informed um, around water metering and the, uh, and the water meter program. Sorry, now I have issues with finding the right version. My apologies. No worries. Would be the one that you emailed us recently, right? Yeah, that's the one I'm there. You go. Um, back to Zoom. Just remind everybody we do have the QA tab at the very bottom there. We already have questions coming in, which is great. Um, questions ranging between you know the types of technology that we're using to detect leaks um, in the regional district. Um, and uh, then around water rates as well. Um, so yeah, feel free to, uh, to send your questions on in. And we do have a couple that we've already received through the engagement platform that we'll also be getting to. And uh, yeah, I'll turn it back over to, to Jen and Remco here to, to launch into the presentation. Thank you, Remco, save the day. Um, to support uh, some of the questions you may have, um, we will share how the SCRD has been using water meters to date and the goals of the water meter program and intentions of the water meter, meter program moving forward. Pictured here is what a water meter installation looks like. So typically found where the water distribution main connects to the property's water line uh, at the end of a driveway. So thank you. Moving forward. Um, the water meter program is a key component of the integrated approach to achieving a resilient water supply. Uh, the SCRD has installed meters in the areas of Egmont, Earls Cove, Pender Harbor, Half Moon Bay, Roberts Creek, Elphinstone, and West Howe Sound. These water meters are read once per month, and this information is used to notify any property owners that have water leaks. In addition, 200 residents have signed up for a monthly water update by email. They receive their average daily use for each month, a leak notification if a leak is present, and a summary of average uh, use across the SCRD for comparison.
Commercial users in all areas, including Seashelt, are billed based on water consumption. And overall, the SCRD is working with the water data to look at community trends that will inform water programming and planning. I'd like to share with you a couple of, a couple of examples, excuse me, of what water data looks like for residents in the SCRD. If we could scroll to the next, thank you. Uh, here is a household that grows a lot of vegetables, uh, enough to last them well into the winter. Their daily water needs increase in the summer as they keep their veggies happy with hand watering. Another example is a home that uses an automatic irrigation system for large lawn watering and gardens. Uh, this property's water use increased by more than a factor of 10 with their chosen irrigation settings in the summer. So you can imagine there is a variety of uh, water usage curves uh, across the SCRD depending on what we're doing at home and our water use patterns. The SCRD is using uh, this water use information to inform future conservation programs or regulations, to inform discussions about future discussions about water rates and the impacts any changes may have on residents, and to evaluate the effectiveness of things like rebate programs, um, for example, our rainwater harvesting program. Moreover, water customers uh, with meters are using this data as well to look at what their water use looks like each month and to make changes where possible to be efficient. Meters are also providing data on water loss in our systems. With over 11,000 properties uh, sharing SCRD water, there are a lot of points in our system where losses can occur. The SCRD has found about one in every 10 properties has a leak at any point in time. Some of these leaks are small, like a running toilet, while others are large, like a leaking irrigation system or water line. A single toilet can lose the amount of water needed to water a vegetable garden for a day. Identifying and fixing leaks ensures our community's water is going towards meeting our needs. In the case of water line leaks, waiting for water to surface or for the loss of water pressure at a house um, can lead to, or does lead to, really large losses of water over extended periods of time. For example, recently in Seashell, the SCRD visited residents without water meters uh, due to sinkholes in the driveway and another resident with a flooded crawl space. Um, both of these were in the unfortunate results of neighbors with water lines that were leaking undetected for extended periods of time. And they were only noticed once property damage had occurred. Since the SCRD reads water meters once per month, possible leaks at all properties with a water meter can be detected once a month allowing for notifications by the SCRD and fixes by residents and businesses. In addition to water meters, there's acoustic equipment designed to detect leaks in water distribution mains. The SCRD has acquired new acoustic equipment and will set target areas for additional water main leak detection each year. So how much water are we saving with water meters? What the data is showing us is that properties with a leak use about four times more water than the average property. And leaks happen regularly, but water meters ensure that we find and fix them promptly. Daily uh, water use is um, typically a bit unknown and can feel a bit invisible for us at home. Seeing water use data in our utility accounts helps us make informed decisions about how much we use particularly when it comes to outdoor use, where we can have high variability in how much we use. Adding the seashell area to the water meter program maximizes these opportunities for savings. The SRD estimates 30% in savings with water meters uh, in place on the entire Chapman water system. Remco, I'll pass it over to you to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Looking forward, the SRD is proceeding with the development of the metering water meter program. Once the funding 
of the meter installations for the Seashelf area is secured, it could take a year to a year and a half before all the meters in that area are actually being installed. Behind the scenes, a lot of other things will occur. For example, we're, we will upgrade the water meter, the database that will uh, capture all the uh, meter data and our information about leaks. We will um, develop our online portal for residents and uh, businesses to view their own water use. And we will of course continue our leak notification program. Independent of the installation of the remaining water meters, staff will present a report to the board this fall to initiate a review of the rate structure review for water. Such process will include discussions with you, the community starting in 2020, and could result in 2024 being the first year that your water bill will actually reflect the amount of water you actually use. Recently, we had several questions from residents about why a long-term loan is the most financially sustainable option to fund the installation of water meters in the Seashelf area. We also received questions about if it would not be cheaper to install all the water meters over a longer period of time than a proposed one year. This graph show what it would cost per parcel within the regional water system under different options for funding and the length of time it would take to complete uh, the installation of all the meters. The project is currently anticipated to cost $7.25 million. However, installing the meters is becoming more expensive every year due to inflation and increasing cost of materials and labor. We predict this to be about 5% every year. So the blue bar on the left shows the total cost per parcel, that the total cost per parcel uh, would be about 800 bucks, $800 if the project were to be funded through a long-term loan with a very low interest and completed in about one year off uh, and uh, completed by a contractor. The annual cost would then be about $44, $54 annually for the residents. In the other three options, the project would be funded through taxation and the meters would be installed in between three and 15 years by SRD staff. You can see that the cost per parcel would vary between $100 and $267 annually. While there are several options to fund a project like this, our analysis shows that a 15-year loan is the most financially responsible option. Any of the other scenarios to fund the project without a loan would result in higher costs for the community in total and per year in order to, uh, and per year. In order for the SRD to access such long-term loan, electoral approval is required, hence the alternative approval process that's currently underway. We will of course continue to seek grant funding from the province and the federal government for the installation of these meters. It's important to note that the, present, that the province recently indicated that having meters installed would increase our chance to receive grants for such water supply projects. So installation of all the meters in the Seashield area soon could potentially uh, save us and the community uh, money in the future for the completion of other water supply projects. The SRD is taking an integrated approach towards addressing the current water supply shortage during the dry summers. This approach has three main components, increasing the supply, reducing the use of water, and implementing operational improvements. The water meter, pro water meter program is a key component of this approach. It can offset cost, water metering costs money, but so does expanding our water supply in the treatment and distribution of all the water that's currently being leaked. Helped with, it will help with early leak detection, preventing property damage as Jen described, and any uh, and just water loss in general. We can't conserve water if it doesn't know how much we're using. There's a lot of residents that indicated to us that they would like to know how much water they're using uh, so that they can actually uh, see where they can reduce it. And it offers an opportunity for fair billing with um, volumetric billing or a pay um, fair use billing. We will actually pay for what we use, which is considered to be more fair than the current flat rate everybody's paying. The 
Previous slides also indicated that the installation of meters in the seashield area funded through a long-term loan is the most cost-effective way for us to achieve this project. Thank you for your interest and in how the SRD has been using water meters to date and the goals of the water metering program moving forward. We'll pass uh, the floor back to the moderator and welcome any questions. Thanks, Rebecca. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jen, as well. And a lot of work went into that, so uh, no, awesome. And um, so we've, we've already had a couple of questions come in and um, I'll start with this one. Um, again, if you have a question, you can type it into the Q&A down, uh, down the bottom there, or else uh, feel free to raise your hand and we can have you uh, ask a question directly to, to any of our panelists. So this question comes from Wendy, and um, Wendy's question is around water rates. Um, Wendy's asking, how will water rates be determined for property owners with two houses sharing one water meter, as they may appear to be using water overages due to the shared meter? I will take that question. Thank you, Aiden. Um, that will all be, be determined as part of the rate structure review that will be undertaken. That's in, anticipated to be undertaken in the upcoming years. Um, it could be that a second water meter would need to be installed to, to address that, or it will be addressed differently. But that's definitely something that is on our radar to be addressed in the upcoming years, if a rate structure review would be undertaken. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we got another question here, and it's it's relating to um, to leak detection. So uh, John has said in, in late 2019, the chamber identified technology to detect leaks in the water mains of the regional district. Can you please confirm what is the current plan for proceeding with this important initiative? Um, leak detection in homes is important, but the impact of leaks in large water mains could be huge. Thanks for that question, John. Good question. Um, Jen indicated in her presentation that the SRD purchased acoustic equipment to identify leaks in water mains. That's exactly, that's a similar type of uh, equipment as the chamber uh, brought forward in 2019. So we're currently in the, program, in the process of acquiring that equipment and we'll start using it uh, hopefully this summer in um, the water, on the water mains in North South Spender systems as well as the regional water system and hope to provide some uh, to be able to provide some results to the board in terms of success rate how many leaks did we found what was the size of those leaks um, later this year perfect Remco could you just talk a little bit again just about how the technology works just kind of how yep. it talks to each other how we identify leaks in yep uh, how it works is we um, on our fire hydrants that we have in the system we can put a kind of microphone on two hydrants and then we can, if there's not a lot of traffic on the road, we can actually hear those microphones can pick up a uh, difference in noises and that uh, will identify leaks in the water mains. So um, it's putting two ears on a fighter hydrant and then moving on to the next one. That's how we can um, identify leaks in, the, in that stretch. Perfect, thank you for that. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we have been asking people um, all this week on, on Let's Talk SCRD or Engage on Platform to send in your questions. So I'm gonna to get to a couple of those. And, and again, if you do have any questions that you'd like to ask any of the panelists, you can type it into the Q&A down the bottom of your, of your screen there. So I'll kick off by asking, um, you know, why are water meter and water conservation part of the overall strategy to address our water shortage? Thank you, Aiden. I will take another question. Um, the water metering program is a cost effective way to save water, to make sure that we're not um, wasting treated water that also has a cost. Because um, we can only increase our supply, but, but if we reduce our consumption and uh, our leaks, we can actually avoid the need to increase our supply. It's, in, it's predicted that installation of the water metering, uh, completion of the water metering program 
uh, within upcoming years could save us about $10 million between now and 2030. And that's, so it's really um, an alternative way to increase our supply by reducing our, our consumption in leaks. So that's why it, it isn't, uh, it is a, it, it is a piece of the puzzle on how to address our water. Go ahead, Director Toth. Did you something add there? Thank you, Aiden. Uh, I just wanted to add in that that there is on the SCRD website and also in my SCRD report for the council meeting uh, from May nineteenth, a couple of very effective graphs that show uh, the effect of water metering and also not water metering on our, our required expansion projects. So even without, sorry, if we don't do the water metering, we're gonna need additional supply projects in addition to what staff have already identified versus the savings that we can realize from water metering, not only pushing off some of those supply uh, requirements, but possibly uh, eliminating some of them. Sure, thank you for that. So uh, the next question here that we have is then, uh, what will happen if the uh, alternative approval process of the AAP fails um, and is unable to secure a, a long-term loan? So I'll, uh, I'll put that into the panel. I can answer that one. At the Regional District Board, we recognize that there are potentially people in the community who are opposed to this, we also know there are a lot of people who are in favor of water meters. When we do an alternative approval process, we're basically asking those people who are opposed to it to come forward and let us know. If the AAP is defeated, we have already in, um, advised staff that we would like them to go forward with an, a referendum with the community. So that will give all members of the community, those in favor and those opposed to be able to vote and let us know what they want us to do. One of the reasons we chose to do the alternative approval process is it's much cheaper. When we do a referendum, we actually, it's, we have to set up like an election. That's the provincial process that we have to follow. So we set up the polling stations, just like we do an election. We hire people, we print ballots. So cost is a lot more. So again, if the alternative approval process is successful, we will not be spending that money but we are ready to spend that money should we need to, to go up to the whole community to, get, to find where they stand on this matter. Maybe I can add to this. Um, thank you, Director Seegers. The, if it were to fail, and even if the referendum were to fail, the only other option is to increase the supply. There is no other option to, then we, we would need to initiate out of supply development um, very soon, which will have that, that additional cost of the 10 million I just discussed. So it is, and maybe it's good for uh, to reiterate, the target we're having is to avoid going beyond stage two. That's the ultimate objective that we're having as a community, that we don't want to go beyond a stage two water conservation uh, stage during a dry summer. So if the meter program, um, meter installations would not be completed, we would have to compensate it by increasing our supply in the very near future to allow for that uh, objective to be met. And if I may, um, one, of the, one of the other things too that we have to consider is if we don't have a robust conservation program in effect, which includes water meters, um, it does put us in jeopardy of getting uh, provincial and federal grants if we don't have that uh, programming in place. And I think that's important to note, uh, especially as as globally, we're looking at um, uh, environmental uh, changes with climate and, um, and water conservation across the board. So um, water meters is just is one piece of our conservation program, just like uh, water, uh, watering restrictions and, and water conservation methods that way. Perfect. Thank you, everyone, for your answers. Uh, we've got a question here that just came in from Tom. Um, and Tom's question is around uh, um, properties that currently have water meters. And Tom is wondering how many of the uh, current 6,200 metered properties 
um, receive monthly email reports of their water consumption. We currently have 200 properties signed up for monthly notifications. And if you'd like to sign up, scrd.ca slash metering or slash water dash metering, sorry, is the place to do it. Jen, could you just talk through, I understand that if people want to get their, um, that monthly update, they contact infrastructure scrd.ca and what are your first, last name, what other information would they need to? Yeah, you can email us, you can give us a call if you like. Um, and we're looking to just uh, ID you as a property owner and um, having your utility account number is handy and your address and contact us uh, with the best email address to send the update to you. And we'll send you your historical usage for the last 12 months uh, in terms of your average daily use. And then moving forward each month, there'll be an update. And it's great to compare last year versus this year and what your use is looking like versus average across the SCRD. Cool, thank you. Lots of good information on those, uh, those updates. And the next question here is then um, folks are asking about what, what's actually involved in the installation of the water meter. Jen, take it away, I will add. Perfect. Um, uh, overall, there's um, a range of installations that will happen for new water meters. It ranges from replacing, uh, some properties have old water meters, um, that will be replaced with a new one uh, up to a much bigger uh, production, which involves uh, locating the water service, uh, installing a, what's called a setter to uh, have the piece of uh, infrastructure to, for the meter to sit in, and then the meter goes in there. Uh, overall, it will take um, one to two years to make that all happen. Ramco, did you want to add to that? And in terms of other items that will need to be considered when we install water meters is a lot of the water, uh, water meters will need to be installed in areas that, for example, now uh, could have invasive species uh, or and we need to confirm that at none of the sites where uh, we'll install water meters, we will uh, find archaeological um, artifacts and uh, there's a, a quite a number of interesting finds that we found uh, when we did our uh, the initial 6200 uh, installations we found a significant amount of artifacts of, of, of value so it's something that we definitely will have to um, to work on as well Perfect. thank you uh, thank Can you I ask, I ask Sorry. question yeah that's another question mm -hmm. on that so if you're installing a water meter on a house, the water probably has to be turned off at some point so that you can actually put the, you know, the infrastructure stuff in place. But how long does it take to install a water meter? Like assuming the invasive species is out of the way, the archeological stuff's done, just the actual installation, what kind of time frame does that take? Actually, once we have confirmed where the water line is, where it needs to be placed, the water, uh, the actual water shut off itself, that might be a question of an hour or less. It's the the location of the finding location of the water main, and that's that's the mature and the digging itself, depending on the depth. Sometimes we have to open up driveways and repair them afterwards. Sometimes we have to open up uh, the road or uh, curb stop curbside. It's that kind of work that uh, is actually taking the majority of the time. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, uh, Director Top, for alerting me to Stu, who's had his hand up here. And um, so, uh, Stu, I'm just going to promote you up here so you can uh, you can ask your question directly. Thank you. Uh, my name is Stu Dornbeer. I live in the district of Seashell. Uh, one of the statistics that has bowled me over in this water discussion has been the fact that of the data that the SCRD has accumulated over the last couple of years, is my understanding, I could be corrected, is that 
9% of those 6,200 metered properties have utilized 38% of the water. Uh, I would appreciate a confirmation of that fact and an explanation as to why, if that is the case, we have not taken a much more aggressive communication strategy with some of those high volume users. In fact, I'm instructed that some of them perhaps use as much as 1,700 uh, cubic meters. Anyway, a, a lot of water in very few properties. And as we're sort of preparing for an AAP and try to win the uh, uh, voting process, and I'm in agreement that uh, uh, what we can't me uh, measure, we can't manage. So I'm in favor of that, but I'm at a, a real loss as to understand why uh, uh, we're two years or more into this process of metering uh, that we haven't taken a much more uh, pro uh, provocative action with respect to our water usage thus far. I think there are a lot of people uh, that are uh, moderate users that are uh, afraid of what watering meeting rates might mean to them. And it would appear that there are some large volume users that uh, really are uh, simply ignoring the problem. Uh, that strikes me as uh, uh, something that needs to be addressed. And uh, it's something that I wanted to present uh, tonight uh, to the leadership of whoever would care to take the answer and uh, 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 tell me if uh, the information that I have is uh, uh, not correct or uh, perhaps I need to be further educated with respect to that point. Okay. Thank you. I will take it and uh, invite everybody uh, to uh, add to what I have to say. Great you're question, correct. Stu. <laughs> you're correct, at, uh, Stu. Thank you for your question and thanks for bringing it up because it's a question we received recently over the last several weeks. You're correct that 9% uh, of the water, 9% of the residential users in 2020 only were using 38% of the water. Um, in 2020 only. So we only assessed the data for 2020 and we did the assessment this spring. And I think within two weeks, we released uh, that analysis publicly. So um, it's not that we sat on those, the data uh, for a long time before we uh, released it publicly. So what I can say is the data are uh, for all the area with meters at the moment, which includes the areas of North and South Spender. The area, North and South Spender are in a different situation in terms of their water supply. During the summer, they, it's rare for them to exceed stage one uh, water and conservation um, regulations. So their ability to uh, irrigate uh, lawns, et cetera, et cetera, is usually um, intact throughout the summer. So it could very well be that some of these High users are with the North South Bender. However, I agree with you that um, 70,000 um, or 1,700 cubic meters is a lot um, of use. Um, what I have to also have to say is we confirmed with some uh, further analysis recently that some of those 9% or significant amount actually has leaks. That those are properties that are having leaks. So those are the properties that we're trying to work on currently as we speak to see how we can uh, help those property owners to, to find the leaks, to identify the leaks, and to uh, urge them to uh, address those leaks, um, to fix those leaks as soon as possible. Um, in terms of communication strategy, we are as indicated, working with the, uh, the residents that are having leaks. And we are also, we will connect with all the other owners as well to at least make them aware of their 
uh, rather high use compared to the average. Are there any, is there anybody that would like to add something to this? Um, I'll, I'll comment on Stu's uh, remarks. I think what Stu is hoping that we'll do is actually publicize, you know, use that fact that we have 9% using 38% of the water in our information that we put out. Because that, that is something in Stu's case, for example, that you know, he, he thinks is very much in support of water meters and believes that that information will have others as well ensure that they get behind the water meter installation process. So I think that's what, what Stu is looking at doing. So Stu, thanks for bringing that up. Did I answer your question okay, Stu? Do you have anything to add? I can see that you're muted right now, just so you know. Okay. Yes, no, thank you, uh, Aiden. I, I do have something to add. Thank you, Mayor Seegers. I appreciate the clarification because I really believe that that uh, is a pretty uh, important point in the communication of this uh, fractious discussion that we have in our community, particularly, uh, and I think, I think uh, more importantly, it's, uh, I know when I sat on a conservation committee for the district of Seashelt a year or two ago, uh, one of the things we were talking about was the supply conservation tension that we have in our community and how best to address uh, that very issue. And it just strikes me, uh, and I, I know I made the point repeatedly a number of times that uh, I think it would really be important for the SCRD to lead by example in, in, in uh, solving and fixing leaks uh, and, and not to potentially at that point to rely on the residential community. I, I'm totally in favor of of everybody uh, measuring it, let's get our act together. But uh, it just strikes me as a, a lost opportunity that we don't uh, take this very issue that we have in our hands now and begin to deal with it uh, in, in, a, in a fairly substantive manner. And that is to address those major residential leaks. It's that kind of demonstration of purpose that will help the community rally round uh, a positive step forward on this whole process. I think failing to do that, uh, it, it wavers a little bit and I worry about that. And I think that as we collect data, the transparency should show. I think that uh, these issues should be, should be addressed uh, in a much more substantive way. I know if I were uh, in a heavy volume use, had the information and somebody was telling me that, listen, you know, uh, this is, you're on a road to, you know, the education piece is fine. You've been alerted. And if you're not doing something about it, uh, there's going to be some consequences to it. Anyway, I, I don't want to beat the point to death, but I think it's a very important point particularly as we enter this discussion, and it would be uh, much more favorable in this community to uh, alleviate that tension and move forward with a, a more unified uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, vote on this whole metering issue. Uh, thank you, Aiden, that's my piece. I think Director. Um, eight, and I think uh, Director Toth had something he wanted to add as well. Yeah, go ahead, Director Toth. Thank you. I'd actually messaged Aiden to let him know that I wanted to add to the answer. So, um, a, a question that came up in the Q and A and that I already answered sort of ties into the tail end of Stu's uh, remarks there with regards to you know, if we've only got a few properties using a lot of the water, can we find those people? Can we increase our education? On it? And the short answer to that is we can increase the education, but we can't go beyond that. Right now, with the water being flat rate billing, you can use as much as you can manage to find use for, and we're not gonna charge you extra for it. Um, to change that in any form 
you know, if you use over a certain amount, we're going to come after you, uh, is going to require changes to our bylaws, to our policies, to staff workings. Um, you know, if, if you've got a substantial leak on the property and the SCRD knows about it and has been in communication with you and you refuse to fix it, the SCRD can come shut your water off. Um, but that's about the limit of our uh, enforcement on the large usage uh, consumers. Perfect. Thank you for that, uh, for that Director Toth. Um, and thank you for your, for, your, for, your, for your questions, Stu. I do know that the statistic that you mentioned earlier, um, the 9% and 38%, I know that our, our water team have been um, providing some education materials through local media and through our website as well. And that has included um, that statistic. But I know from a communications and engagement standpoint, and for sure, the ongoing communication around those, uh, those usage statistics is something that I'll, I'll have as a takeaway um, from this conversation. So, so thank you for that. And we've had just a, a couple of other questions just around, you know, we, we talked earlier about um, receiving reports um, of, your, of your water use. And we actually had two questions which are, which are pretty similar come into the Q&A portion here. Um, basically asking whether or not uh, we're considering sending everyone their water use reports without them requesting it. Um, you know, Tom makes a point that it's possible that uh, many people would reduce their usage if they had the information. Um, it appears that for whatever, reason, for whatever reason, not many people are asking for the reports at this time. So, yeah, so would we, you know, essentially send them out to everybody? Jen, I think you're... It's definitely something um, that we're working towards. So we're working right now to get our database talking to our utility account database. So um, that can be something that is available in, in the very near future. So you can log in and look at your data for your property without um, a, a sign up process. So it makes it more accessible. We don't have a list of everyone in the SCRD's email addresses, etc. Um, to, to send it out uh, rapidly like that, but we're, we're setting up um, easier access in the very near future. Thank you, Jen, and for that. And so we have another question here which had come in through the engagement platform earlier this week. Um, and it's asking, should the water shortage be addressed before the SCRD installs um, water meters? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I think what we're indicating is that uh, what I indicated before is our integrated approach that we're taking where we are uh, promoting water conservation and increasing supply. So in terms of the supply, we uh, made significant progress over the last uh, several years. More information on that can be found on our April 26th uh, Let's Talk Water um, presentation that's still to be found on YouTube and on our website. So during that presentation, there's more information about actually the update, where we are with the projects. But a quick summary is that our church road project is uh, the development of our church road well field is well underway. We're working with the town of Gibson and Squamish Nation and the province to uh, to ensure that there is no impact to the long term sustainability of the aquifer, uh, the, the community water supply to the town of Gibsons, as well as any interest of the Squamish Nation. We we're uh, we're uh, making headway there. We're, we don't have, we're not in a place yet that we have been issued a water license. So a, com a construction date uh, to start the construction of the project cannot be provided yet, but um, I hope it's coming soon. So actually that's a project that a couple of years ago was in non-existence and we're now, uh, next step would be to actually put a shovel in the ground uh, to have something, to have a significant amount of extra water online next year. The Langdale Well Field Project was identified last year as a potential and earlier this year, the board decided to advance that one as well. So that will be the development of a well field at the Langdale Terminal uh, property. We already have the well there at, at the moment and uh, project would include to drill two additional wells on the property and to connect it to the Chapman water system. 
we are currently uh, preparing. Um, uh, we we have initiated a process to to attract a contractor to help us with that project, and our two other uh, three other water supply projects that are more still in the feasibility phase, where we're confirming the feasibility. That is the well field at Marianne West Park, uh, the development of a water water reservoir, and an upgrade to. Um, our existing intake at Cray Creek so that we can use it um, year round instead of only for a couple of weeks a year. So we are making significant progress on the water supply side. And I think that's why um, we're, we're doing it simultaneously. We are making the progress on the water supply side as well. Perfect. Thank you, uh, thank you, Emko. We've had a, a question come in here from Dave, um, and Dave's asking, uh, how do meters find leaks in homes? Um, they can tell if I have a running toilet, and um, can they tell if I have a running toilet? So yeah, how do they find leaks in homes? Yeah, a meter is uh, set up to um, create a flag or a notification in the data set when water's flowing through it 24 hours a day. So it's the continuous nature of the water flow over an extended period of time that generates that notification for us. And we in turn uh, use that to notify residents of a possible leak to look out for. I encourage everybody that wants to see a very educational uh, video about this to uh, just go to YouTube and search in search for SRD water meter, and you will find a very short, in, in, very informative meter about a video about how meter works and how to actually, how it can detect the leak. I'll see if I can find that, uh, that video and pop it in the chat before the end of the, uh, the end of the session. This isn't on the sheet and it hasn't come in as a question, but I'm kind of interested in this as well. And I know we, we have other folks. So if you find a leak, um, can you just explain what the process is, you know, for, for a homeowner? And, um, you know, if, um, if, if it's been established as a leak in the property, and um, maybe just to talk us through that, um, Ben and Renko. Sure. What happens currently is uh, we generate a set of letters on a, it's about a quarterly basis right now. We're ramping up to be able to do it a bit more often. Um, and uh, a resident will receive a letter from us that shares uh, their current average volume um, compared to what um, average looks like in BC um, and the fact that there's 24 hour flow happening. And the idea is using those two numbers, um, they can get an idea if it's something small that's happening like a toilet or a tap or something large that's happening at their home then they need to look uh, a bit further for something outdoor like a water line that's leaking. Um, and from, in addition to that, we give a brochure with some troubleshooting tips for, for isolating a leak. Um, and uh, we're av available by phone, by email uh, for follow-up for residents that um, would like some more conversation in terms of troubleshooting leaks and, and next steps. Um, yeah, any other questions, Aiden? I can expand. Perfect. Sorry, thanks, Jen. Um, so we did have a question um, which came in earlier this week just regards leaks on properties without a meter. So can we check for leaks on properties and that are not metered? We cannot. So um, in a house, um, for example, people may be able to pick up on a dripping tap or a toilet that's whooshing, that kind of thing. But in terms of anything that's going on underground, etc., cetera, it, it takes uh, a significant amount of water and often property damage, et cetera, to come into play before that leak is realized. If I can add to that, uh, Aiden, it's really, the only opportunity there for us is if we happen to do our work with our acoustic ears, that we, if we can, uh, occasionally we can find one, but it will be uh, uh, very sporadically. Usually when we get notified by customers that there is, for example, water on the street or that they, get, uh, that they have a very wet area in their backyard and they're considering where it's coming from, we can confirm if it's uh, SRD water or groundwater. 
by uh, using seeing if there's any chlorine residuals in it, etc. So we can test if it's groundwater or SJD water, but um, we cannot, it was still hard for us then to identify actually where the leak is coming from. Perfect, thank you. Um, we've had a question just asking about uh, utility billing. So will a leak affect um, my utility bill? So will folks affect folks' bill? Currently, the answer is no, because currently our, uh, everybody is paying a flat rate everybody's paying the same rate, regardless of the amount of water they're actually using. Um, however, there is a cost associated with the water because uh, the water is leaked. And hence, um, if the leak is not addressed, if a lot of leaks are not addressed, we would need to increase our supply. And hence, uh, only indirectly as a result, there would be an impact to, uh, to, the, uh, to the water bill because it would go up. That, I think that's one of the, uh, one, once we have uh, a paper a volumetric uh, system in place, uh, only in that scenario, if you were to have to leak, then your property bill, uh, your, your, your water charge will go up. Any director, anything to add there or Jen? I would add that in the case of um, really um, leaks, like a water line burst, that kind of thing, that unexpected large volume of water that can happen. Um, in the case of volumetric build billing um, is often a policy goes in place with that for an adjustment to be able to be made to a bill. So um, if you have a really timely fix, you find the leak, fix it right away. That section of volume that kind of surprised you and escaped um, can be, it can be um, thought about in terms of an adjustment. So that's something that CRD would think about moving forward with rates. Perfect, thank you guys. Just for regards and uh, leads themselves then. So um, does, does the meter um, set some sort of physical indicator if there's a leak? Or can residents kind of look for themselves between um, the meter readings? It's just the comment that we had in here. Sorry, can you repeat that quickly? Of course, yeah. So it's asking just, does the meter set some sort of physical indicator if there's a leak in the property itself? So essentially, can residents look for them themselves or do they have to wait between the, the, the readings that will be taking place? On the display of a water meter, there's um, a leak notification icon, excuse me, as well. Um, and it's a dripping tap, so it's nice and easy to figure out. So a flashlight on your meter display to allow it to wake up, kind of like a calculator. And um, looking for that icon on your display would let you know if you have a leak or not. You also get real-time flow in terms of the data that's showing on that display. So you can look at the rate of water flowing through there. If nothing is on at your house and water is flowing through there, then there may be a leak. Perfect, thank you. Um, another question that we've had come in was just asking about rates and it's then um, what the expected rate for metered water uh, would be per cubic meter. That's a question we all would like to have the answer to. And I think it all totally depends on uh, the type of structure we, uh, the SRD uh, would initiate if we're, if we're going to, if we're going that way. There can be, there are different set of rules that can be applied. If it's, is it the tiered system like BC Hydro? Is it uh, when what are the thresholds between the tiers? There are all kinds of decisions that would, that would need to be made before we can actually confirm what the rates will be uh, per cubic meter uh, for different households. However, what is known is that, for example, in a community like Mission that um, installed water meters in their community uh, in the recent past, 80% of the residents were actually going to pay less than what they're currently paying. And only 20% of the residents were going to pay more than what they're currently paying. And we expect that in, uh, for, the, for the SRD community, a similar trend uh, could occur where the majority of the people will start paying less than what they currently are and uh, a limited amount will, uh, will might have to pay more. Mm -hmm. 
Chair Pratt, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, a, a couple of things too. And um, it's not like we're going to suddenly switch, switch the, uh, flip the switch and, or turn on the tap and put you onto a uh, volumetric uh, pricing. We have um, a few of the things we've talked about is, uh, is actually, you know, a lot of engagement, of course, because we want to make sure that we're, we're going with a volumetric pricing that makes sense. Um, we do need that baseline data. Um, Another uh, community that you can look at that's even closer to is what the town of Gibsons uh, did when they went to volumetric. Um, they uh, something that's really important to note is their residential usage went down. Well, it was uh, about forty percent, wasn't it, Remco? Um, when they went to water and metering across uh, the town of Gibson, so that's a it's a great success story just within our um, own community. Um, so it's it's. The data really helps because we don't think, you know, when you're brushing your teeth or you have a running toilet, you just don't necessarily, you know, think about how many liters of water that is a day. And it's it can be uh, astronomical when you're looking at some of these numbers. And as Stu said earlier, you know, that that nine uh, nine percent of properties using uh, 34, 38 percent of the wa residential water use is um those are staggering numbers to think about, so. Director Toth, I know you, you had something to add here. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Aiden. I just wanted to add in that, you know, one of the things with volumetric billing, with, with any of the billing and in with regional district services in general, is they're all very siloed. We can't take water revenue that we've received and use it to build a new aquatic center, right? even though they both use water. Um, revenue received within the water function has to stay within the confines of the water function, future planning, you know, growth development, things like that. So the overall cost of the, you know, of, of develop, uh, delivering water uh, within the regional water system isn't going to change. So it'll just be sort of how it's apportioned out to the users of that water. Um, you know, the, the bell curve sort of thing. If you're on the downhill side of the bell curve, you're gonna pay less. If you're on the uphill side, you're going to pay more. I just want to note we have lost uh, Mayor Seegers just uh, due to a computer issue. So um, yeah, she didn't fall in the well, uh, <laughs> but uh, her computer has given up the ghost. So there you go. Anybody to add in that last question? I'm going to move on to the next one. We're good to go to the next one. So um, the next one is, uh, and this came up a little bit earlier, just around our own distribution system. So, you know, what is the SCRD doing about leaks uh, in their own distribution system? I will start there. I talked earlier about um, what the SCRD is doing. Is we have 24 seven monitors and meters and sensors um, all across our system. So staff, uh, what are the utility staff uh, will receive alarms if something major is happening. For example, if there's a large water main break, usually we're getting questions from um, customers, uh, residents, uh, sometimes emergency services, but also our own staff. Mostly uh, in most cases, they're already underway because they received an alarm through our systems. If there's a smaller leak, let's say there's a leak in, a, but it's not really flooding an area. We, uh, if residents observe uh, a moist area or water on the road, usually uh, they will be able to get a hold of the SRD. And uh, we go on site and we confirm through testing if it's indeed our water or if it's, um, if it's groundwater that, or uh, if there's another water source, usually it's groundwater or SRD water. And, if it's SRD water, we're usually able to, uh, just by digging and um, professional knowledge, uh, able to, to find out where the water main uh, break will be. Usually that means that we have to open up a road and uh, find the leak and uh, replace it and fix it. The acoustic uh, tools I just described are, um, we have an older system of that and the new system that we currently are, um, acquiring allows us to, with with support of dedicated staff, to, to assess 
50% of the north vendor system, let's say 50% of the south vendor system, and a portion of the regional water system this year to identify if there are any leaks in our main water distribution. So um, we're doing a lot to make sure that we have our we have and keep our house in order as well, uh, as well as helping the residents do the same for them. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Remco. So we got about um, five minutes left here before we we look ahead to, to starting to wrap up. So again, if you have any any more questions that you want to ask, uh, feel free to, to put them in the Q and A tab down the very bottom of your screen. And you can also raise your hand um, if you'd like to ask the question um, yourself. So um, just for folks who may not have joined us earlier, you know, earlier this week, we did uh, ask for questions on our engagement platform um, at scrd.ca forward slash let's talk. So uh, we've just been rolling through a few of these um, as the session has been continuing on. So another one which came in was just asking about new developments uh, here on the coast and what impact that's having on, you know, water supply planning. So um, I know who wants to take a shot at that one first. What we're doing in our uh, water supply planning, we are include we're um, including a projected growth of about 2% annually. Um, that's what we've been doing since for about nine years now that every year we assume that there's 2% growth. However, the actual growth uh, since 2010 has been less than 2% a year. So, um, but to make sure that we are on the safe side of the story, we um, we are uh, including a 2% increase. It's There has been discussions in the past uh, with residents have been asking of why not just stop uh, development until the water supply issue is, is addressed. Um, one of the things uh, we've been discussing with residents at the staff level is the fact that development is also required to uh, to ensure that we uh, increase our affordable housing on the coast and that we uh, support our economic development on the coast. And I was wondering if one of the directors might be able to add a little bit to that. Go ahead, Alton. My apologies, I didn't catch the very tail end of what you were uh, what you were saying there, Remco. I had something come up, but uh, uh, Chair Pratt, if you heard him, you start. We'll add on. <laughs> well, one of the things uh, GM Rosenboom was talking about was, um, you know, we are we are needing to add in um, more residences on the coast uh, just because of the housing crisis that we are in. So we can't. Um, I know it's, I've seen on social media and I've heard comments myself and, uh, and it certainly is something that we grapple with, you know, what happens uh, or, you know, why, why are we not stopping growth? And um, well, it, it's also a, a, it's a huge economic driver in our community. Um, the building community is very, um, they're huge employers. Uh, they're huge supporters of our community, of our volunteer organizations um of of students of um of children families um putting that and we also need them to continue to build so we do have those housing opportunities coming forward uh so you know it is it is a struggle and it's certainly it is something we hear um but that's why we're we're doing this integrated approach to water where we're looking at increasing supply through the wells, but also looking at the water that's already in the system that's already treated that we can keep in the system through these leaks and also letting residents know how much water they're using. One other thing I wanted to add in uh, to follow that is that development does help to pay for new water infrastructure. Um, we collect development cost charges for water, just like the municipalities do for roads, sewer, parks, etc. Um, you know, staff during the budget process for 2021, staff did bring forward a couple of projects to be partly funded through those development cost charges. Um, water supply expansion on Eastbourne, uh, in the Eastbourne area on Keats Island, is being partly funded by that growth revenue that we are receiving from development. And without that, that's on taxpayers, uh, 100%. Mm -hmm. 
Sure. Thank you, uh, Director Top. Thank you for your, for your answers on that. And we got one more question, um, and then I think we're pretty close to, to wrapping up. But um, yeah, if anybody else has anything to add or any other questions, you know, you can feel free to put them in the Q and A, and we'll try and try and get to them. So um, it's following on uh, through this conversation here. Uh, Matt's put a question in to the chat here and um, asking what what other assumptions do you make? when forecasting water demand into the future, growth, per capita demand, rainfall, et cetera? Good question. That's great. Uh, Remco, do you want to start? Yes, I will, I will start. <laughs> so what we include today is um, our summers are getting drier. And um, on an evening like today, when we see a little bit of rain coming down, um, at least it makes me happy because the last several months has been really dry. Since February, between February and until today, we've been significantly receiving less rainfall than uh, the averages over the last 10 years. So in that trend, we've seen that also during the summers. And um, so the impact of climate change, we are including that in our uh, projections moving forward, as well as population growth and um, what, what else, what's the question? What are our assumptions? And tell you now, I'll read a few again here, uh, here Remco. Um, the, the, the demand in terms of on the demand side, we on the demand from the community, we're assuming that demand from the community is such that we can stay at the stage two level. And so we, we have looked at, um, in years that uh, we were able to stay at the stage two for a long period of time, what was about the average use uh, per capita at uh, that stage? And that's what we used to uh, to build our uh, the model on. So it's really all intended to, okay, what how much water is used by the community to and uh, how much water do we, do we then need to supply to make sure that we stay at the stage two level despite the impact that growth and climate change is having on our systems. And it's important to note that it's not just about the rainfall that happens or the um, it, that happens down here, like at, at the residential level, there's, we can have different rainfall amounts that are happening up in Chapman and Edwards Lake, which are providing 85% of the residents on the Sunshine Coast with water. There's, um, you know, we look at, uh, you know, we we keep our fingers crossed for snow, which I know most West Coasters don't really, but uh, we love to see snow up there in the mountain. And, um, you know, like uh, that can help to predict what we're, where we're going to be at. But uh, with climate change, we are seeing um, we're seeing drier winters. We're seeing longer stretches of of dryness through um, through the the spring and summer, and um, you know, so it, it is worrisome, and it's hard. It is difficult to predict. Um, you know, it's uh, weather is always uh, you know it's always going to be a, a question mark, and um, what happens up in um, in the tetrahedron in the watershed can be much different than what happens down here. So. Um, we, we not only need the water that happens down here to water our gardens and, um, and, you know, but we also need that, we need a lot of water up in the watershed too. And, um, it's really, it, it's, it's tough. I mean, you go, you can, um, we go by our years of water usage, looking back and, uh, as the predictor going forward and, uh, and, hopefully you know as we as we bring more water on and as more conservation efforts work as well as the uh, conservation strategies we have for the water level restrictions uh, like for example a couple of years ago when we went to um, I think the biggest change that we could have possibly made was not allowing lawn watering after stage one and that's that was had a huge impact on um on safeguarding our water and we really we took a step as a board to really concentrate on being um you know looking after food and so allowing for that food um production to go on so that is something else that we'll look at too if we going forward is you know do we need to adjust the um the water restriction bylaw too so just want to add on to that there is, there is actually a knock-on effect from us looking at diversification of our of our water sources 
you know, right now the regional water system is primarily Chapman Creek driven. As climate changes, you know, what have you, we're not able to rely on that single source of water as much. We could have a landslide in the Chapman Creek Valley and all of a sudden we're cut off from our water supply. Uh, so, so the addition of wells allows us to diversify those sources a bit more. It also saves us from having to uh, expand our water treatment plant that we do have up on Reservoir Road. Um, I know I'd heard a number in a previous meeting, um, but the forecast was that sort of by 2021, we would need to expand the water treatment plant. And as our per capita consumption goes down, and as we start to look at other sources of water, we may, we may never have to make that investment in the Chapman Creek treatment plant and, and save those tens of millions of dollars. So. Perfect, thank you. Uh, we got two, two questions just to finish up here. Um, one is, uh, it's just asking about uh, metered users. So it's uh, given uh, the 9% of metered users accounting for such a large percentage of total water use, and whether directly or indirectly, wouldn't these accounts be one of the primary drivers for needing increased supply and hence their usage would be driving up the yearly rates for all users? Oh, that's a, it is. Um, I think, I don't know if Remco wants to touch that one first or Jen maybe. Sorry, I thought I would read it again, just to be sure here. I can repeat it here for everyone. So uh, given the 9% of metered users accounting for such a large percentage of total water usage, and um, whether directly or indirectly, wouldn't these accounts be one of the primary drivers for needing increased supply, and hence their usage will be driving up the yearly rates for all users? Um, I don't know about, well, this is why uh, our water, um, our water division really they follow up with these high account users. Um, and as Jen and Remco explained earlier, like what the process is for, um, you know, for dealing with um, high water users is making sure and following up. And um, you know, it, it's um, I think probably a really good example of that is uh, from our last infrastructure meeting when we uh, had the uh, the gentleman from uh, Selma Park Road speak about how much water nine residences on um, in that on Lower Selma Park Road were using in a year, and and just and he himself had two broken water lines on his property and just uh, how the district uh, how the regional district uh, was able to assist him in not only locating those leaks, but just, you know, just pinpointing them. And, and these were leaks that were happening for a really long time. And, and it would have, it would have shown up as a high water usage. So, you know, it's, it, it adds to our whole, um, it adds to the whole picture on why, why the metering helps to find those those leaks um, and and connecting with individuals or you know um, I'm thinking of the other story I, I've heard from one of our water techs on how um, that we had a high water user um, in the community and it turned out that they had their water their water pressure in their house was so high that they were leaving a tap on outside the house to lessen the pressure within the house. And it wasn't until, you know, they were given some education on, on why you don't want to do that and how expensive, you know, it is to the whole system. So, so a lot of that, I think, ties right in, it dovetails in with our education and letting, letting our community know, like, you, you know, this whole piece, like, 9% of metered users using such a percentage of water and um, and what it actually costs, you know, the water that falls from the sky or sits in Chapman Lake is um, is untreated. We have to provide treated, fresh, safe drinking water coming out of your tap. That's that's our responsibility as the regional district as being your water supplier. And that it's not a cheap thing to do. The um... The, I might just move on to the next question if everybody's okay with that. Unless anybody has anything you'd like to add, it's okay. And um, Chair Pat, you mentioned education there, and we've actually had a question about that. And this is something that I think a lot of us can touch on in this group. 
Um, any plans for public education on water use conservation or personal water collection incentives? Short answer is yes. <laughs> and and Jen, Jen and Remco can tell you what we're doing. <laughs> To be honest, I think the fact that we're here and uh, thank you for all the people that are watching. I think this is this is one of the opportunities we're we're creating to have a dialogue with the community about what are use water consumptions and what are what are what actually we're doing. But uh, our staff are able are willing uh, to answer any questions residents have about their own use. They can just call um, infrastructure services department is more than willing to help. If they have any other questions, uh, sure, we are there. Once COVID is a little bit less, we will be out there in the community also a little bit more with our outreach events, um, with our booth and other uh, opportunities we, we have. Um, last year, it was a little bit on, uh, of course, due to pandemic, it was restricted, but we were looking forward to be out there in the community again more and engage with the residents. One of our most frequent uh, points of engagement is actually around uh, when we do our patrols in terms of water conservation in during the summer to make sure that uh, residents are adhering to our watering restrictions. During those uh, months, we have a lot of conversations um, in person with residents or on the phone about uh, the water conservations, what are, how everything works. And, Jen, is there anything you would like to add there? Because I think you play a big role there. Um, only to add that um, sharing some information about typical water use patterns and, and habits resulting in water use is definitely something that we're building on. And um, in terms of programming that supports it, like rebates, et cetera, we have a rainwater harvesting rebate program and um, keen to hear what um, the community feels like would surface, service them moving forward and um, would like to continue to build on what we do. I just wanted to, to add in that um, there are other steps that people can, can take rather than just waiting for the SCRD to, to come up with the answers. You know, I'm, I'm a big believer of, of self-reliance. You know, I, I did, I, I am in a position where I was able to take an opportunity to install a 1600 gallon rain barrel and I use it in my garden. Not everybody's in that position. One other thing that I did do, and I, I love to point this out to the directors that aren't tracking their water usage, is I had to replace a hot water tank a couple of years ago. And at that time, I installed a water meter inside my house. You can get a residential grade indoor water meter for under $100 you can monitor your own usage. You can see where you're using it, how you're using it. You just got a new pool, you want to fill it up. You can see how much water it took to fill that pool. And that's, that's an easy piece of infrastructure that people can install in their homes themselves uh, for their own education if that's something that they're interested in. So I just wanted to add that on. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Did you have anything to add on the educational funds, uh, Chairpa? Well, we're, I mean, we've got tons of um, information online on the regional district website. You can Google, like there's water conservation methods. I mean, I think as a kid, um, you know, we were, we were taught back then, you know, don't leave the water running when you're washing your hands um, and brushing your teeth and, you know, turn it off in between and, and, um, and don't let it go the whole time. There's, there's so many things that we can just little things here and there, you know, running, um, making sure the dishwasher is full before you run it, or, you know, it, there are many, many things that we can do. And we're always happy to share more. And I think back to a couple of years ago when we did our, our water dialogue series at, um, you know, in C. Shelton and Gibson's and, um, you know, everything from the, the shorter showers to, um, you know, uh, just everything. Like there's so many different ideas that we can do. And, and it's, as uh, Alton was saying, you know, if, 
as we move through, if you're curious yourself, it isn't in inexpensive to um, to do a personal one and just figure out how much water you're using. You know, I when you have uh, you, when you have children or a family, it's uh, it's really hard to lose track of how many how many liters of water your children are using. So, which is something I understand greatly. Um, but it, it's so key, and it's it, it's just. It's just such a precious resource. I, I grew up on the prairie, so um, water and grew up with a with a well on a well property. And so you had to be so concerned all the time about that. And uh, there's always something we can do personally ourselves. Perfect. Thank you. And just to, just to add, you know, we do have lots of great resource material, as you mentioned, on scrd.ca. And as well as that, on our, on our engagement platform, um, scrd.ca forward slash let's talk, um, we have created project pages to give you further information around, you know, the water projects that Remco touched on earlier, you know, Church Road and the Langdale Well project. We have information up there on the, on the water meter program and also on the, uh, on the AAP program as well. So, you know, feel free to jump on there. You know, you can, you can ask questions directly to staff. We've got really good infographics up there um, which really uh, help you learn more about conservation and about your own use of water and, and the water meter program, as I mentioned earlier. So um, thank you to everybody who's, who's attended um, this evening. As I mentioned, the link to this conversation will be available on YouTube um, here in the coming days, as well as that. You know, I mentioned earlier, I put it in the chat, you know, continue the conversation over on the engagement platform, uh, the Let's Talk uh, Water. And um, on the water meter project, there is a short survey um, which has been put up there. Um, so feel free to, to jump on and to, uh, and to fill that one out. Um, so I'm gonna leave it to, uh, to, to Chair Pratt. I'm not too sure if you, if you have any kind of closing, um, quick closing remarks, sorry. I don't know if <laughs> Potter, GM Rosenboom. Um, if anybody has any, any closing remarks, if not, that's fine, we'll just finish up. But um, yeah, I just wanna leave it open to the floor if anybody has anything they'd like to say in closing. Alton, you go first. Okay. Um, I, I want to say not only thank you to everybody who's attending and thank you to everybody who's watching on YouTube and we'll watch this later on YouTube. Thank you, Aiden, for moderating tonight. You've done a bang up job. And uh, thank you to our staff for, for being here at you know almost 8.30 at night now to, to help with answering questions for the community. Um, as, as directors, we try to make ourselves available to answer you know, the political side questions anytime people have them. And it's, it's nice to have the staff support uh, for the technical questions as well. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Remco, Dean, Jen. I'm more than happy to con continue this conversation with any of the staff, any of the residents in the public in the upcoming weeks uh, while we proceed with the AP. Um, we can staff is more than willing to talk about the financial part of it, the benefits of water management program. Just connect with us and uh, we'll set up a conversation. And uh, thank you everybody for attending. Really beneficial. Thank you. Um, and uh, before Aiden wraps us up, I'd just like to say also my gratitude to everyone for attending and uh, for great questions and the conversation. I hope, um, I hope this has been informative uh, for everyone. Um, we, I've become, become quite the expert on water as I'm finding. And it's, uh, it, you know, um, it, it's just, it, it's, it's tough because it, the infrastructure is expensive and, um, but we need to move forward in order to continue to support our community. So um, we understand um, that it's, you know, it's an expensive proposition, but conservation is, and um, getting the data for how much water we are actually using is just as important as bringing on new sources. So uh, thank you all for being here this evening and uh, thank you to staff for, uh, for getting, um, for being here for support and answering questions and putting the presenting on. Thanks Aiden. And thank you to Mayor Seekers and Director Toth for both being here as well. And even though we lost Director Seekers somewhere along the line, so. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Good night.